Thanks for having me along. I'm Dave Paul. I'm the product manager for RED. And three weeks ago, uh, the engineering team released the latest update to 3D and RED. So this is an ideal opportunity just to run through some of the features that that, that update brought to the RED product. So um, before, so this presentation is going to take about 30 minutes, and I'm just going to uh, cherry pick seven of the new features that RED adds in the hope that uh, some of those are valuable to you in your use of RED back at your workplace. But before we get into RED proper, I just wanted to have a quick intro to the sister product 3D. So uh, the primary use case that we recommend for 3D is for Data Vault customers. Is it's, a, it's a method of modeling your data vault in, uh, in a, in a modeling environment and then generating a red model within 3D, importing it into red, and it's a, it fast tracks the process of creating data vaults. So in recognition of that workflow, the 841 update to 3D adds a new uh, data vault creation wizard that streamlines that whole process. So we've had some input into a number of data vault ECMEs to get that uh, workflow refined. And so uh, those of you that are interested in uh, data vaults and interested in 3D, I recommend that you have a lash at that. So the, the 3D update, not only does it have this new uh, wizard, it also has um, performance enhancements for the advanced copy feature. It now supports the Snowflake and Amazon Redshift databases as targets and it has enhanced model conversion matching criteria. But we're going to look a little bit, uh, touch on a little bit of 3D later in the presentation. But let's move on to why we're here about uh, new features in Westgate Red added in the 841 release for those that haven't had a look yet. So as I said, I'm going to cover uh, seven uh, features and there's several more that uh, you may be interested in, but you uh, just uh, ask you to go and have a look at the release notes from the download um, page to, to uh, familiarise yourself with the extras. So the first one I'm going to look at is uh, setting default templates for your update routines. So uh, Red for the last couple of years has been extending the use of templates for code generation. So uh, prior to that, all of the code generation for your different targets was built into Red. So we had uh, sets of code generation for SQL Server, Teradata, Oracle, and the like. But with the influx of additional database technologies like Redshift and Snowflake and the like, um, it was, wasn't was really practical to, uh, every time a new database technology came along, to tap on another code generation within Red. And Templates app provides us the ability to add additional generation capability quite easily. It also means that new features that come along, like data vaults, to our existing platforms, we're able to provide generation for those new object types more efficiently. And so we want to improve our support for template. And, what, and one of those areas that we wanted to improve is setting of defaults for code generation. So in the prior versions of Red, we had this feature where we retained the last year's template for a specific object type in the registry. So if you created a data vault stage table and you used a specific template for that object, the next time you went to create a data vault stage table, we remembered what template you used last time and offered that as the default for generation for the second object. But there's obviously downsides with a registry-based last used concept that you couldn't pre-configure it, so once you you install your fresh, new, shiny red repository. You couldn't preload what you wanted as your default. You couldn't share those defaults between different users of the same repository. You couldn't distribute the defaults when you uh, distribute your other objects in a deployment application. And if you had two different target types, you're a bit stuck because we only had one default regardless of what target type you picked. So in 841, we changed that model so that the default is now stored in a target connection. So that it means that if you've got a SQL Server target and a Snowflake target, you can have a distinct set of defaults for each. 
and that means that takes away all of the other restrictions. So you can distribute your defaults along with connections and your deployment applications, and they can be shared across all the users of that repository. But perhaps the biggest benefit, and we'll cover in the next slides, is that it also gives us the opportunity to automate the generation of the update routine. Because Red in the repository knows what template you want to use to generate your, say, your update procedures for your data vault stage tables, we can now automate that generation as you deploy an object. So I'm just going to um, cross to a, a, an empty Red repository. So this is um, a fresh install. All I've done so far is create a few target connections, one for load objects, one for stage objects, and one for everything else. And I've, um, I've used the standard red deployed templates for SQL Server for data vaults, and I've got this new tab in the properties screen called routine templates. So you can see here, for example, my data vault stage tables, I want to use this particular template to generate the update routine to those objects. So as I say, the, there's two benefits to this. One is if, if you're generating new objects directly in red, every time you create an object of that type, it'll default to that template. You can obviously override it for the temp default if you don't like the for a specific requirement. But it also means we can leverage those defaults when we do code generation during application deployment. And we'll cover that next. So does that make sense? So the next feature, as we just said, is automatic generation of update routines. So if you're deploying an application from one red repository to another red repository, the code for all your objects is in that deployment application. You typically, you've created a table, you've generated the update routine for it, that's stored in the metadata, and then when you create an application to that object, the definition of the table and the definition of the update routine are in the application and are deployed to the target repository. That's not the case if you're a, a, um, deploying an application from 3D. In 3D, it's a modeling tool. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily know about code generation. It knows about the definition of the tables in the model and the relationship of those tables, and that's all. So a deployment application from 3D, when it came into RED previously, you ended up with the tables, um, but you didn't end up with any code generation. You had to generate that in RED um, as, a, as a subsequent step to deploying the application. But now that's no longer the case. So it's probably, rather than uh, read it in bullets, it's probably easier to show you in, a, uh, in the product. So if I cross to 3D first, so I've, um, I'm no 3D expert. All I've done is create a very simple um, data vault model in 3D using the new wizard, which I have to say is a lot easier. Um, the only um, prerequisite step I'm going to do before I create my red model is I'm going to set up some what they call target descriptors. So what this is, is you saw before that I had three targets in my red repository. I had a, a dedicated target for load tables, a dedicated target for stage tables, and a dedicated target for everything else. So the default template to use to generate objects is assigned to those target connections. And so in order for the um, setup administrator to build the right code for the right objects, it needs to know where these objects are going to reside. And it does that using these um, tags to say which objects exist for what we, we want to place and which, um, which target. So I've got the same... Um, location descriptors labels as I have targets in red. So that's the prerequisite. So once I've got that, I can uh, go to my uh, load and stage model. I can use this fancy new button to prepare for red, pretty difficult. I give it a name. 
conversion and I create it. It's going to say what target database platform are you going to deploy this model to? And I'm going to pick SQL Server. And now it's, it says, OK, you've got all these tables you're going to deploy to read. Um, yeah, you're going to use your target descriptors to say where you want those tables created, and I do. So firstly, I'm going to filter my load tables, select them all, and I'm going to um, assign them to the location load. I'm going to search out my stage tables, and I'm going to allocate them to the stage marker and everything else I'm going to stick in my EDW target. That's it. So then we carry on with the generation. So this is an optional step, so I can create a group, and this group will translate to a read project. So basically all my deployed objects, when they're loaded into read, they'll be automatically assigned to a project so I can easily identify them. So I'm going to pick them all and stick them all into the same group. So this step is just saying uh, for my load table objects, what uh, data type mappings do I require? So my source is a SQL Server and my target SQL Server, so I'm just going to have a SQL Server to SQL Server data type mapping. And then I'm going to hit go. And it's going to go through the rules to tidy it up and make it ready for the deployment to read. So if I scroll out, it all looks very similar. So that's my model that I'm going to send to Red. It's got the, uh, I, uh, my eyesight's so poor I can't tell what's what, but the, the hubs, links and satellites are at the top and my stage and load tables are at the bottom. And then I'm just going to export that to Red. Let's reuse an existing name of another one that I've already had there. So that's built my deployment application, and it's launched setup administrator ready to load that into my read repository. So I pick my read repository out of the list. This is the empty one that we looked at before. So the only pre-work that's happened in this repository is saying for those three targets what the default templates are for my code generation. So this all looks very similar. It just says what objects are coming in with the application. And this screen is exactly the same. The, the change is these two settings here. Is um, for a 3D application, the option to generate update routines is defaulted to true because there aren't any update routines in a 3D application, so it's a good thing to create them. And for a red deployment application, that defaults to off because normally the, the code is already in the application. The second setting is that you know, for, for database types that have indexes, it's the building of the, of the update routine that generates the automatic indexes. So if, if, the, if setup administrator is generating the code, then we might want to generate indexes at the same time. So that's, that option set to true as well. And then I just run the deployment like normal. It loads my um, tables from my 3D model into red. So all this step is all exactly the same. So now it's, uh, this is where it's different. As you can see that um, my load objects have found a default template to use for their code generators and it's generating the update routines for all my objects that I'm deploying in the application. Yeah, so we know that um, you know a lot of our Auckland customers are uh, you know SQL servers and oracles and the like and they're using the built-in code generation. So I, I know that um, a number of these features I'm talking about, data vaults and template based code generation is probably is a is a fairly small percentage, but I it, um, I'm confident that that will change. Overseas, we've seen 60% of our new sales of red are to customers using either um, custom targets and or data vaults. And I, you know, based on past trends, I'm sure that New Zealand will follow that trend over time. So.
That's our, that's by far the most common of our what we call custom targets, the yeah. non SQL Server Oracle targets is Snowflake, yes. So that's um, that's loaded my application. So if I refresh the metadata in that in the uh, um, in red, you can see it's created the that the group that I created when I um, created my de red deployment has come through as a project, and you can see that my all those objects we loaded it in. So that's all just the same as before. The only difference is that all my objects have a an associated template and it's created the update routine automatically. So basically all of these objects are all ready to run um, directly on the deployment. They don't need um, manual code generation anymore. So it generates in the file. What's that? Generates in the file. Yep. Yep. So obviously you can do scripts, but yeah, in the case of procedures, they compile the procedures as well. And Additionally, all of the indexes are all auto-created as part of the deployment as well. That's good. But, yeah, honestly, I, I, um, the uptake in Data Vault um, in Europe in particular has been, um, well, has exceeded my expectations. 60% reportedly of our customers are either, either doing Data Vault or Mixed Data Vault. So um, it's a, it is a growing trend. So and that, and I, I guess, like I say, the, um, that's... This feature is, is um, going to be very useful for anyone that's interested in 3D in particular. So if I just cross back to the PowerPoint. So the next feature I just wanted to cover, now that I've got some objects in my repository, I can play with some other features. Um, this is the first of two new wizards to, um, and this one generates, automatically generates applications based on a selection of objects and their dependent objects. So previously in red, you could define an application manually in the, in the build application screen, or you can build an application from a trackback diagram. So what customers requested was, is a, a version of the logic in the trackback diagram route on steroids, so that you could have multiple objects that you track back from and have the superset of all of their objects in the application. So that's what we've done with this new option. So we've got a, a new context menu on a project group or multi-selection of objects called build, and then you can go build the application and it, it completes that workflow of not only including the objects that you've selected in that scope, but all of their dependencies as well. So I can, now that I've got some objects here, I, hopefully I can show you that. So that um, the, the project is one of the items that gets that new menu item. So build and build, build application. The name of the application is defaulted based on the project. And you can see in here that the objects to add and replace, that that's the complete list of objects in my project. And if there were any objects that were a dependency of these outside the project, that would be included as well. So we hope that that would um, make a tidier workflow, for example, for deploying new work. Does that include parameters? Uh, does it include parameters? No, it's, it's only things that you would find in the trackback diagram. So, so normally table objects and the update routines. Source metadata is the same objects So the next feature is uh, is the is related is the similar wizard for the generation of jobs, and you know, I know that some of you have got uh, very complicated routines for the way you create jobs, and obviously the dependencies for those jobs is quite hard to work out manually. So again, we did have a fairly automated route where you could create a job based on a trackback diagram. But that only tracked back from a single object. If you wanted to track back from multiple objects in one go, we didn't have an automated workflow for that until the 841 run. So it's the same workflow. If we cross back to red, we can go to the group. You probably saw the option before. 
build and build job. So it's a very similar thing. You've got a, a default a definition of the job based on what you selected. And then all of the tasks are the, item, uh, are the objects in the scope of that group and their dependencies. And it's done all of the um, ordering of the tasks to, to match the dependencies. So all the node tables are first, and your state tables are second. And so, um, so that that job should run out of the box with the correct dependencies. So we think that's quite a powerful feature for people that are trying to automate the process of building a new job. So number five. So the next feature is, a, is another, um, what we hope is time-saving feature. So back in 811, uh, somewhere in there, 811 we introduced uh, source mapping objects. And the idea of a source mapping object, for those who haven't used it, is that if you've got a, a table object, but it's sourced from multiple source systems, you can have independent update routines all um, populating that common table from a distinct source, optionally run at a distinct time. And, that, and that's done by a source mapping object. So basically it's a, it's a container to say that um, to give a, mo a meaning to one mapping between source system and a target table. So what we've tried to do is because the uptake of source mapping objects, particularly for data vault customers, has been quite strong, we wanted to improve the functionality of source mapping objects. And one of the things we were asked to do in relation to source mapping objects was allow the ability to regenerate code for multiple source mappings in one step. So previously, you could only list the source mapping objects for a single table object. So there was a bulk regenerate option for source mappings, but because it was only in the scope of one table, if you wanted to generate the source mappings for multiple tables, you had to do it for each table individually. So in the 841 release, there's a new context menu added with, to list all source mappings. And that populates the center pane of red, and then you've got the bulk um, the bulk selection context menu that allows you to regenerate the procedures for all of those source mapping objects across multiple tables. So if I cross back to red and go back to the builder screen, so that um, projects is one of the uh, recipients of the new list all source mappings. Because I'm a bit uh, light on my uh, 3D uses, I've only got six of them, but they're across three table objects. And basically the motive for that multi-selection window is to expose the code regenerate. So the, work, the use case might be that you've made an update to your um, template to generate the code for your source mapping objects. And you want to regenerate all the objects that are used by that template. So now you can do that through this workflow. So... Number six on the list is uh, the option to set a column transformation on multiple columns of a table at once. So the, uh, the problem that we're trying to resolve there is that if you had a large number of columns in a table and you wanted to apply a common transformation to all of those columns, previously you'd have to go into the column properties, go to transformations, enter your transformation string for that column, go next column and complete the same process for all the columns that you want to apply it to. So what we've done is we've always had the um, change columns uh, context menu for multiple columns, so we've extended the functionality of that to include transformations as one of the things you can apply in bulk. So if I, probably easier to show you than explain it, so if I pick a table with um, if I pick one with uh, lots of text columns in it, say this one, makes it easy. So if I pick these um, six columns and go to the, the pre-existing change columns menu, they've got the new option at the bottom called transformation. And you open up the uh, familiar uh, column transformation thing, but you can see here that there's 
um, a new substitution variable added to either target column or source column. So if I pick a function from the list, uh, say left trim and right trim, and paste in the substitution variable for the source column, and click OK. So now those, all of those columns that were in the scope of that multi-selection have now got a transformation. If we're going to have a look at it, it's, you can see that uh, at application time it substituted that variable of source column with the actual column name and now all of those columns have all got that transformation. So uh, the last one I just wanted to cover before I um, uh, finish up is the is a change to our our version control menu, an extra feature on our version control menu. So Red for some time had this version control that allows you to uh, create a snapshot of an object at a point in time. And then you could use that snapshot in uh, one use case is that you could create a new object based on that snapshot. But customers have suggested that that feature would be very handy in the event that you wanted to back out an unwanted change. And so to make that possible in one step, we've added a revert option. So the advantage of the revert option is that uh, because the object has the same object ID, then all the relationships with that object are persisted. So if you, if you revert a table object, its relationship with this update routine is maintained. And if it's in a particular job, then that sheet of a job is not impacted either. So I'll just um, swap back to red. We'll see if we can demonstrate this. So because this um, repository is brand new and all I've done is import these objects, I've got very few um, uh, uh, versions in here. So I'll just uh, create one uh, somehow. So I'll put a, a label of my version for my objects and I'll version everything in my red user group project. So that's just gone and taken a snapshot of all of the objects in that project. And so now if I, oh, I'm on this stage table here, if I make a, uh, a uh, change here and delete my address column, and then I decided for whatever reason that that change was not the best, then I go to the uh, pre-existing um, uh, version management, version control uh, context menu, and you can see the new option at the bottom, revert to version. So this brings up a familiar dialog that says that I've got one version checkpoint loaded in the time that it was created. So I can see that that was before my change, so I picked that one. And it's reinstated my address field. So again, I, I kind of I hope that that would be quite useful. I mean, you know, potentially you could use the same thing in your update routines if you've got a modified modified procedure, for example, and you for whatever reason you didn't have an XXX modification, you could revert that procedure back to a prior state where we had a known result with it, that kind of thing. So we hope that, that might be useful as well. So I've only picked. Um, uh, seven of the features that are um, in the list of things that have been added for 841. The detail on the remainder are in the release notes which are available from the uh, support downloads page. And those of you that received the email notification for the release will have seen that there's a link in that email to a set of videos that um, introduce some of the key features similar to what you've seen today. So if you want a reminder on how to use one of those features and the release notes um, uh, doesn't explain it to your satisfaction, um, seek out that email and have a look at those um, uh, new feature videos just to see if they help you. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.